All right. Good morning. And happy Sunday. Uh, my name is Daniel, one of the servants here at Hope Church, and I want to welcome you to our Zoom worship service. Uh, we begin our time together with a call to worship because we acknowledge that it is God who has the first say in worship. So the call to worship comes from Romans chapter 11, verse 33 through 36, which reads, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Church, our God has called us to worship. So let us turn now in prayer and ask God to bless our time of worship. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise you, O God, of all wisdom, knowledge, and strength. You are God, worthy of praise, whose thoughts and ways are higher than ours. For you not only direct all things to your glory, but have also chiefly given us your Son, Jesus Christ. It is by his blood that we have been saved from our sins and made your sons and daughters. Through him, you are both just in punishing and dealing with our sin and justifier in making us righteous before your presence. So as you have called us now to worship you, help us to worship in spirit and in truth, not for our name, but for your name and our delight in you. Lead us in our time of worship. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let us respond to the call by singing praises to our God. Oh, oh. 
name above every name, Jesus. See, I will sing. And I will sing forever, Jesus, I You made a way when you 
Truly, uh, we are sinful and we are unworthy. But Father, despite this, you sent your one and only Son to die for us upon that cross in the greatest display of love that history and humankind has ever seen. 
So, Father, we thank you for uh, your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your invitation to worship you in this house uh, this morning. So, Father, as we come before you today to give you praise and to give you worship, Lord, I ask that uh, that you will be with us. Help us to be fixated solely upon you. Won't you work within us what is pleasing only to you, Father God? Be with us at this time. We love you, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we continue our worship, and part of our liturgy, the order of worship, is to take time to confess our sins and to be reminded of the gospel. And so in order to do that, we turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 through 12, where Paul writes, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. In Reformed theology, there's a distinction made between the law and the gospel. It's the law, God's law, that shows us that God is a holy and just God but that we have fallen short of this holy standard, deserving nothing but his just wrath. But on the other side, there is the gospel, the good news that we have been given a savior who fulfilled the law completely and paid the penalty for our sins and all who trust in him have life. So the law reveals our problem, the gospel reveals the solution. And in these verses, Paul reminds Christians that no one no one is justified by law, by their own works, because they are sinful. But in Christ, we have been redeemed so that when we confess our sins, we don't become acceptable to God, but we confess because we are already accepted and, and then called to live for him. So whether it be sins of anger against others, pride, lust, envy, greed, sins where we fail to do what is right, we are called to lay all those things down before God because he has forgiven us in Christ and called us to live in him. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what your week was like. I don't know the idols or the struggles of your heart, but I do know that Jesus Christ gave his life on that tree to pay for your sins and to save you from them. This truth will never change. And so let us come humbly before him and confess our sins turning away from those things and turning to Christ, our Savior and our chief comfort and our only forgiveness. So let us take this time now silently to confess our sins before God. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ has come, that all who trust in him are forgiven of their sins. As Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentile, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Father, you are our holy God, and we are your holy people. You are our redeeming God, and we are your redeemed people. Lord, we confess that we fall short of what your holiness demands, yet we acknowledge our sin and lay them humbly before you, not so that we may just be relieved of our burdens, but to cry out to you in forgiveness to lead us more to Christ. As the law reveals how sinful and corrupt we are, the gospel becomes even more good to us who are weary, tired, and desperately in need of a Savior. Thus, we praise you that you have sent your Savior, Jesus Christ, and become our redeeming God. It is through Christ's accomplishment on the cross that we are redeemed, that he became a curse on that tree so that we who were under the curse of sin could be freed. And so we praise you and thank you, God, for through your spirit, you lead us to cling all the more to Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
And so we pray, God, for the preaching of your word as Christ speaks to us through your servant, Pastor Joe. God, would you illumine Pastor Joe's mind as and use the words that you have prepared through him to encourage the saints, challenge the idol, soften our hardened hearts, and lead those who do not know you to knowing and saving faith in you. Give Pastor Joe strength and use him mightily, for he speaks not as a mere man, but as your messenger, delivering the words of our Lord and our God. And by your spirit, work in us as your people, that we may have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive your word with all eagerness and gladness. God, you have shown yourself to be the one who hears and cares for your people. So teach us to pray now and all the days of our lives. As we do so in the manner your son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So after, after the assurance of pardon, we confess our faith. And as a Reformed Church, we want to know the truths that we believe in. And to do that, we use the Heidelberg Catechism, which is a faithful summary of what the Bible teaches. And so last time we talked about how Christ's death paid for our sins and purchased eternal life. And so we continue to consider Christ's death and its, be Christ's death and its benefit for us. And so question 43, I'll read the question and then join me as we respond with the answer together. And so question 43 asks, what further benefit do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? Through Christ's death, our old nature is crucified, put to death, and buried with him, so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer reign in us, but that we may offer ourselves to him as a sacrifice of thankfulness. Amen. At this time, Pastor Joe will come up to deliver God's word from Acts 25, verse 1 through 12, with a sermon entitled, Living to Please God, Not People. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we may be experiencing what they call May Gray uh, today, and we had a lot of those uh, recently. I hope you're doing well. If, if you're struggling in any way, um, you know, because of this prolonged pandemic or whatever the reason, please reach out to us, to me. Uh, I, I have an ongoing uh, pastoral visitation planned out so if you want to meet with me please do not hesitate to contact me uh, today we're continuing our series in the book of acts or the acts of the holy spirit through the church we're slowly approaching the end as i said last week and from acts 24 1 through 27 last week we encourage people not to procrastinate their decision to follow Christ, to commit to Him in the light, in light of the historical reality of the resurrection. This week, <clears throat> we're encouraging people to live to please God instead of people. Live to please God because God is pleased with you in Christ Jesus. For this, we turn to Acts 25, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> Hear now the word of God. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he, province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, and the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking him, asking as a favor against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the man of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. 
When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, Neither against the law of Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? <clears throat> but Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no, no wrong, and as you yourself know very well, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. The word of God. Amen. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, uh, we admit, Father God, that we often live to please people instead of, Father God, focusing on living to please you. Lord, as we come before your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit would work in our midst, that your word will convict us of our sin, that your word, the gospel, reveal grace, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you would, Father God, inspire us by that grace to live our lives for you. May your spirit work mightily in our midst today through the preaching of your word. As people hear the word, Lord God, may your spirit transform our hearts, renew us, restore us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> it is more important than ever to be controlled by God's opinion of us rather than other people's opinion of us. Because the truth is, oftentimes we're controlled by other people's opinion of us. Today, kids don't have to step out of the house to be made fun of. This week, I heard the story of a mother suing Snapchat because her 16-year-old son committed suicide after he experienced cyberbullying through these apps, these two apps on Snapchat that allowed people to remain anonymous while bullying him without any consequence whatsoever. Since the lawsuit, Snapchat has suspended both these apps, but <clears throat> you know the damage has been done already. It's heartbreaking to hear of such a tragedy, right? When I was little, I only had to worry about people that I came across. <laughs> in middle school, I remember I was scarred by these kids in Baltimore, this school in Baltimore, who made fun of me because I wore a pair of fake Nike shoes that my father had bought for me from Korea. It had an extra swish, or maybe two swishes, at the end of the swish. <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but it was no laughing matter then because opinion, the opinion of these kids mattered so much to me. Also, my dad <coughs> gave us clothes that he used to sell <laughs> because, you know, he was in textile clothing business and it had Playboy Bunny logos on it, on them. <laughs> I was shocked to find out what these logos stood for. But before I knew about it, I proudly wore them in front of my friends, these same middle school friends, because my father had made them. <laughs> scars, more scars, <laughs> made fun of again and again. But today, young people can be hurt by the opinions of others who don't even know them from thousands of miles away. It's a very dangerous world we live in. And so we need to equip our young people with a sense of identity that is founded in Jesus Christ so that they are not controlled by the opinion of others. But this is not just for young people, is it? We who are older, and, <laughs> and I can say that we're older. I'm 
one of the older guys, we who are older carry the scars of old wounds and we still allow fear of people instead of fear of God to rule us instead <coughs> of allowing God, fear of God to rule us. Here's the main point of today's sermon. Because God is pleased with us in Christ Jesus, yes, in Christ Jesus being a key word, we live to please Him, God. And we're going to talk about it in, this, uh, in two parts. Number one, those who live to please God. And number two, those who live to please God. Oh, let me say that again. I think I read it wrong. Those who live to please people, number one. And number two, those who live to please God. Festus seems to be a much better governor than Felix. Festus came replacing Felix. It's very interesting. Felix uh, means happy. Festus means festive. <laughs> what an interesting name, right? Because uh, background scene is not something that is happy and festive. It's all about a trial, right? And these people don't have true joy in the Lord. Uh, anyway, it, instead of procrastinating like procrastinating like Felix, Festus went to work right away as soon as he arrived. We're told three days after he had arrived in the province, you know, he goes up to Jerusalem. According to the historian Josephus, during his brief tenure, Festus governed fairly most of the time, and controlled the civil unrest but as we will see we can categorize him as one of those who live to please people instead of God let's go to our first point those who live to please people in verse 1 we see Felix traveling up to Jerusalem from Caesarea Felix knows that Jerusalem is an important religious and political center for the Jews and so he wants to make a good impression upon the people he is governing. And while he is there, the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews lay out their case against Paul yet again. Even after two years, they are restless to get their hands on Paul. They ask a favor of Festus that Paul be summoned to Jerusalem. But their plan was to set an ambush to kill him on the way. They still couldn't wait to kill Paul. Festus invites them cordially to come to Caesarea with him instead, to bring charges against him there. Festus seems like a nice guy, doesn't he? He comes all the way to Jerusalem to meet with the Jewish leaders. He comes so that he could start off on the right footing, right? Let me make it clear from the start that it is not bad to please people. It is not bad to be nice to people, right? We don't want to be people who displease people all the time. We don't want to be people who are grumpy all the time. We, but we don't want to live with the goal of pleasing people over against pleasing God. That's what I'm talking about here. Right? <clears throat> After eight days or ten days, Festus goes back to Caesarea and conducts a trial of Paul. The Jews bring similar charges against Paul that they had brought before. Felix, Luke com comments that they could not prove these charges. Then Paul argues in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesarea, have I committed any offense. There were no witnesses even, right? Uh, nor has the case been proven against Paul. So Paul, as a Roman citizen, should have been declared innocent. But Festus shows that he has his own serious flaw. You know what that was? He lived to please people. Look at verse 9. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor. Did you hear what Luke says? Festus is a people pleaser I mean this is a serious charge because this just it's not just simply being nice this was a travesty of justice Festus knew what the right thing to do was but instead he perverted justice because he wanted to please the Jewish leaders 
he compromised on justice. When we live to please people instead of God, we tend to make compromises. That's what I want you to note here. When you fear people instead of God, you make sinful compromises. In his book entitled, When People Are Big and God Is Small. Isn't that a telling title? Wonderful title for a book. When People Are Big and God Is Small. right? Ed Welch defines the fear of God as a reverent submission that leads to obedience. A reverent submission that leads to obedience. The Jewish leaders feared people instead of God. They wanted to please all the Jews who had risen in an uproar against Paul. Ironically, they feared what Paul represented. He was one of them who had turned away to follow Christ. He was a walking, talking witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? He was sent as a persecutor of the church and he had returned as one of the fiercest proponents of Christianity. That's why they wanted him dead. So as we read, the Jewish leaders, including the high priest, plot to kill him again. The sixth commandment clearly says, you shall not murder, yet they were unwilling to compromise on the very law God, you know, God had given them. You know, they were willing to compromise on the very law that they accused Paul of breaking, right? Not the same commandment, but the law. Religion without Christ, without grace, without fear of God can be very corrupting, right? Religion without Christ, religion without grace, religion without the fear of God can be very, very corrupting. And that's what happens here. They compromise. If you're honest, we would have to admit that we allow fear of people to rule over our lives instead of the fear of God too, right? Think about so-called white lies that you tell your boss to avoid getting in trouble. Why not just tell the truth? In his book, Ed Welch says, that evangelism is a good test of whether we fear God or fear people, right? Think about that. I mean, the book of Acts is all about being witness to the risen Lord, right? You shall be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That is the commission here in the book of Acts. Why are we not witnessing to others when God clearly clearly wants us to share the gospel with others? Well, Often it is because we fear people instead of God. We are afraid of what people will think of us, what they will say to us. And the truth is we see our fear of people in so many other different ways too. Think about this. Do you live with a need for an approval from your parents, from your friends, and or your spouse? You know, as a... As an observant child, you know, I saw this in my father. My father wanted my mother's respect. That's one thing he really, really craved. He wanted my mother to give him the due credit that he thought he deserved. My father wanted my mother's approval. But you know what? My mother wouldn't give it to him. And you know what my mother wanted? My mother wanted my dad's love, right? My, that's what she craved, unconditional love from my father. It's so, so sad because both wanted something from the other. They were unwilling to give to each other. And so the relationship suffered, right? What were they living for? They, they felt that they needed the approval, right, of each other. They needed the respect, love of each other. And that's what we think too. We think we need the approval of our friend, friends. We need the approval of our parents. And what happens is when you, the need that you have, these kind of things begin to control you because you think you need th- these things. They begin to control you. Let me say this. 
oftentimes these need become a consuming thing but you don't need the approval of your parents you don't need the approval of your friends you don't need the approval of your spouse what you need first and foremost is God's approval you need to know that in Christ Jesus God is God is pleased with you let me say that again you need to know this is what you need right you need to know that in Christ Jesus God is pleased with you that's what you need to know right don't let don't let this need for an approval right consume you need for approval of I'm talking about not God but parents friends spouse whoever that may be your girlfriend boyfriend what you need is to know th that God is pleased with you in Christ Jesus we see here that there are those who live to please people but there are those who live to please God we come to our second point those who live to please God <coughs> clearly in the reading of the book of Acts we have seen how Paul lived to please God but before I talk about Paul I want you to, I want you to focus on Christ the reason why Paul live to please God <clears throat> in this section of the book of Acts we have seen Paul go, th go through many many trials four trials um, you know if you define trials loosely and the fifth one is coming next guess how many trials Jesus went through five Paul goes through five trials these trials of Paul point us back to the trials of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Jesus did not live to please people. Instead, he lived to please God the Father. In John 6, 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If the definition of the fear of God is a reverent submission that leads to obedience, my goodness, Jesus is a perfect picture of the fear of God. During those trials, interestingly, Jesus remained largely quiet, silent. Whereas Paul defends himself and his faith because he fears God, right? Jesus stays quiet because he fears God. Because he knew that the Father's will was for him to be crucified to save us and to make us the children of the living God. Jesus obeyed the Father's will to the point of death on the cross, we're told in Philippians 2. As a result, those who put their faith in him are counted as sons and daughters. You see the beauty, the grace in what Jesus has done for us? The problem you face, the problem you and I face day in and day out is that you allow yourself, I allow myself to be put on trial to be judged by others and yourself, right? You allow the opinions of other people to control you. But if you're a Christian, we need to know that the verdict is in already, right? You are loved. You are already, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, a child of the living God. And if you have not, I, I beg you, I beg you to put your trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. You see, Jesus faced the trials for us. Jesus went into these trials, suffered unjust judgment, was crucified to death. Why? To be our substitute, to die in our place, to make himself the condemnation, right? to make himself the recipient of the condemnation that we deserve so that we would not be controlled by these trials that we put ourselves through. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, you see, the Father is pleased with us. Jesus took on a, upon himself the sin we deserve. And when you put your faith in him, 
Jesus Christ's righteousness, His righteousness, right, is imputed to you. Your sin is imputed to Him first. And then His righteousness is imputed to you. So the verdict is in when the Father sees you, right? He sees His Son, Jesus, in you. The verdict of the only person whose opinion really, really counts is that you are his beloved son, daughter, and that he is well pleased with you. Remember what the father said to Jesus the son when he was being baptized? Jesus, the father God said to Jesus the son, you are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased. For those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ, when the Father sees us, He sees His Son in us. And so He is very, very pleased with you. You need to hear Him say of you, You are my beloved Son, daughter. With you, I am well pleased. You see, Paul knew this grace of God. Paul was a persecutor of the church, but Christ showed him grace, and Paul came to realize the love of God in Christ Jesus. He writes in Galatians 4, 4 to 6, But when the fullness of time had come, Kairos had come, God sent forth his Son, born of women, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, right? As Daniel said beautifully this morning, the law reveals our need for Christ and shows us, leads us to Christ, right? So that we might receive adoption as sons. The gospel, this is the gospel message, right? In Jesus Christ, we, we are received, adopted as sons and daughters. And because we are sons and daughters, it says God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now we can cry out to God saying, Daddy, Abba father. Ed Welch shows us that there is a continuum of the fear of God. It goes from terror, dread, trembling, astonishment, to awe, to reverence, to devotion, to trust, and then to worship. The beginning of this continuum is where we hide from God because we, we find out how holy He is, how we find out about His holy justice. And the end of this continuum is where we seek, draw near, and submit to God because we know not only that God is holy, but that God is loving. We find out about not only His holy justice, but His holy love. You see, Paul came to fear God with awe, reverence, devotion, trust, and worship. Have you come to such a place where you recognize who God is. And because Paul came to a place where he realized God is pleased with him in Christ, Jesus, he was willing to do anything for God. Let me, let me say this again. Let me emphasize this, right? What we do for God is a response of the grace we received, right? We don't do these things to to please God. No, because in Jesus Christ, we are already pleasing to God. We seek to live our lives to please God. There's a huge difference, and I hope you can see the difference, right? And so let me read that again, because Paul came to a place where he realized God is pleased with him in Christ Jesus. He was willing to do anything for God. He was willing to live to please God. As Ed Welch says, the person who fears God will fear nothing else. If you fear God, you will fear nothing else. Paul was not afraid of death even. He was willing to come to Jerusalem, if we've seen this, even if that meant death for him. Because he, he was moved by how much God loved him. He was moved by grace. He was compelled by love of Christ. And, and before Festus, the Roman governor, you know, many of us could have been scared to face somebody like that paul is not scared and instead he boldly speaks and because jesus told him that he must testify about him wrong paul tells festus that he does not want to go back to jerusalem instead paul says i appeal 
to Caesar. So Festus concludes, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. If pleasing people leads to make us, let me, let me start over, if pleasing people leads us to make sinful compromises, pleasing God leads us to be willing to pay the price of obedience. Let me reiterate here that Paul was willing to pay the price of obedience because he experienced the grace of God. Because he knew that God was pleased with him in Christ Jesus. Right? That's why he lived his life to please God. And that's the point of today's sermon. I hope you get this, right? We don't just live to please God, to earn God's favor. No, no, no. Christ Jesus, because of his finished work, because... Jesus is pleasing to the Father. Those of us who are, who are united with Christ, those of us who have Christ in us, when the Father sees us, He sees Christ, and so He is pleased with us. And when we know that grace, when we understand that grace, we live to please Him. That's our response. right? Paul knew that Jesus Christ paid the price of obedience, so that we may know God's love as sons and daughters. So, Paul was willing to pay the price of obedience also. Again, after all, fear of God means a reverent submission that leads to obedience. So let me ask you, are you being controlled by the opinion of others? Right? I mean, you know, with, with the advent of all these social media you know, so often we are seeking approval of people when we post things, right? And are you allowing the fear of people to dictate your life? Are you living to please people instead of God? Through the gospel message today, hear God say to you, You are my beloved son. I am well pleased with you. You are my beloved daughter. I am well pleased pleased with you. Allow the opinion of God to control your life. What or you, let me read this again, what or who you will, you need will control you, okay? Whatever you think you need will control you. Whoever you think you need will control you. Let me reiterate, you don't need the approval of your parents, friends, spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend what you need the most is the approval of your heavenly father and if you are in christ jesus your heavenly father says to you you are my beloved son daughter i am well pleased with you and having heard that voice of the father respond yes respond it's a response right respond by living to please him as i was preparing for this sermon you know as i prepare for a sermon oftentimes i listen to christian music and as i was preparing um, i heard a song by lauren daigle entitled you say and this speaks to this issue listen to what she writes she says i keep fighting voices in my head that says i'm not enough every single lie that tells me i will never measure up am i more than just the sum of every high and every low remind me once again just who i am because i need to know right and this is how, how the chorus goes you say i am loved when i can't feel a thing you say i am strong when i think i am weak you say i am held when i'm falling short and when i don't belong Oh, you say, I am yours. And it goes, and I believe. Oh, I believe. What you say of me, I believe. And this is what second verse says. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. Listen to what it says. The only thing that matters now is everything you, God, think of me. In you, I find my worth. In you, I find my identity. Again, let me read the chorus. 
You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I am when I think I'm weak. You say that I'm held when I'm falling short, when I don't belong. Oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, oh I believe. What you say of me, I believe. My prayer, brothers and sisters, is that you believe what God says of you. Let us pray. Father, we are so tempted to be ruled, controlled by what other people say of us. And yet we forget what you say of us in Jesus Christ. Father, you say of us in Jesus Christ that you love us, that you are well pleased with us. And so, Lord God, this morning as we come before you, help us to seek you. Help us to seek to hear what you would have, have us hear instead of focusing on other people. Father, may what you say of us control us, that we are your sons and daughters whom you love and you're well pleased with. We thank you and pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let us respond to the message we've heard now by singing Amazing Grace.
God's praise than when we'd first begun. Now we go into a time of tithes and offerings. Again, you can give online at hopepcsd.org slash give. Uh, thank you so much for continuing uh, to support the gospel ministry uh, through your tithes and your offerings. And to pray for these things, uh, we're going to invite Pastor, uh, uh, Elder David Song to come up and pray for the offering. Let us pray. Father God, we're gathered here to worship you, to praise your name in all things. At this time, um, we offer up our, our tithes and offering, offerings to you in humble submission to your guidance in our lives. Thank you so much for the message today by, by Pastor Joe, reminding us, like Paul, that we're often under much pressure from the world. And, and we oftentimes, our actions are more toward pleasing God, uh, pleasing, pleasing other people than to you, God, where our hearts and our intentions are lie. Father God, help us to be strong like Paul, to stand up to the, the pressures of this world uh, where peer pressure can mean so much to us, where we just want to fit in, where we just want to gain, uh, gain the accolades of everyone else. We want to get the more likes, uh, we, we just want to be praised by other people rather than seeking you in our, our thoughts and our hearts and in our actions. Thank you for the, the story of Paul and how he persevered during this time to be committed to you and following your will rather than trying to please other people. I pray you God that in during this uh, pandemic, that uh, despite the, the tremendous pressure that all of us here face, that we're still able to look upon, look toward you and seek you know, your guidance in our, our things and help us to be confident in pleasing you first and pleasing you more than anyone else here on earth. I thank you for your greatest gift that you provided us, your, your son, your only son in our Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you for your love and I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Uh, now it's time for announcements. Uh, we want to welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, <laughs> we are yet to have in-person worship, uh, but we want to encourage you guys, if this is your first time, go to our web uh, website and click on uh, a icon that says connect with us and a welcoming team member will reach out to you and help you get connected to our church. Next, uh, thank you for uh, joining us for worship and uh, we right after we have what we call reflection time to go over the message so that we can apply the gospel truth to our lives. Uh, after today, uh, TAG and YAG Reflections uh, will be taking a break, okay, to give our leaders a break, uh, to give all of ourselves a break so that we can come, come back really uh, excited about uh, the reflection time together. And uh, so college will make a decision today what to do, but YAG and TAG Reflections will be taking a break. So join us uh, for today if you are able to, but... Uh, we will take a break for a uh, few months, um, perhaps until we are able to meet back in person. Okay, next. Uh, please continue to worship us online. As we said, we have a, uh, we have 
started a committee committee that is looking into how we can safely open up for an in-person indoor worship. Please pray for that committee that is headed by Elder Jim. Um, much thanks to all of you who are serving. Thank you so much for your faithfulness during the pandemic. Thank you for serving. Next. After the service, we invite our children to worship live for Sparks Worship and youth students to watch the youth group sermon online. Please uh, find the links on uh, hopepcst.org or uh, slash bulletin. Next. We want to show our love to our college seniors and there is going to be, praise God, uh, we didn't have one last year uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, we are going to have an outdoor senior banquet at the gathering, right, May 29th at 6 p.m. So um, please join us and let's show how much we love and appreciate our college seniors. Next. And in response to ongoing humanitarian crisis at the border, we are trying to uh, work with uh, the Hope for San Diego uh, by helping out the children. So please, if you're interested, please contact d or Elder Mark. Next. And as I said earlier, I'm seeking to meet up with you. So please sign up by messaging me. Next. Um, the Men of Hope um, Bible study continues on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. and they're studying the Gospel of John. If you want more com uh, information, please contact Jonathan or Elder Mark. Okay, uh, if I may ask, uh, can I, I ask of you to turn on your videos so that I can see your face as we sing the doxology together as, as I give the benediction. Okay, let's all turn. I want to invite you guys to turn on your videos. Yes, great. Thank you. Good seeing you guys. Great seeing you guys. Okay. Let's sing together. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And now receive the blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Stick around for a short time of virtual co coffee and donuts, time of fellowship. I want to encourage you guys to stick around if you can. Uh, let's say hello to one another before we go. <laughs> okay.